17, beginning at verse 1. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and, and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. But the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason uh, was welcome, has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they put Jason and the others on bail and let them go. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than those of the Thessalonians. For they received the message with great eagerness and explained the scriptures every day to see if what Paul and examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Many of the Jews believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, they went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. The men who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join them as soon as possible. This is the word of the Lord. Well, before we look at those verses and some of the implications of those verses, we're seeing another hymn, which is, Lord Jesus Christ, you have come to us. <laughs> Thank you. 
Please be seated. I prefer the authorised version and the version I have in front of me, which in verse 6 of Acts chapter 17 says, they dragged them and the brothers before the city authorities and they shouted, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. These men who have turned the world upside down. I think that's rather better than cause trouble over all the world. The events of Acts chapter 17 took place during Paul's second missionary journey. The first journey was with Barnabas, but because of problems over Mark, who returned early, Paul took with him Silas on the second journey, and Barnabas went off with Mark. If you look at the journeys that Paul did in those days, I think they add up to something like 7,000 miles, something like 7,000 miles in that day when there was no transport, no roads, no jets, no nothing. So when Paul preached in Thessalonica, in the synagogues over three Sabbaths, he argued from the scriptures that Jesus is the true Messiah. And of course, in doing so, he trod pretty heavily on Jewish sensitivities because Jesus' teaching, his background, his way of life, his premature death, they just didn't fit in with the Jewish view of Messiah, the expectation of a strong military leader to free them from the hated Romans. They had their own template, their own specification, if you like, and everything about Jesus and his message just did not fit. In fact, it was the antithesis of what they wanted and expected, particularly when Jesus meekly submitted to capture and to death. That really was the last straw and only confirmed their view that he was an imposter and deserved what he got. Hence, I chose that first reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul does say that the gospel is idiocy to the Greeks, doesn't make sense, and it's foolishness to the Jews, just does not fit in with their expectations and their views. Yet increasingly, there was this strong undercurrent. There were people and rumors claiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. In fact, there were hundreds claimed to have seen him after his death, thus vindicating all that he said and all that he had done. He was indeed the true Messiah. Paul was extremely convincing in his preaching in Thessalonica, proving that Jesus was the Christ from the Old Testament scriptures. And he was so convincing, in fact, they didn't really bother to argue back or to reason with him. They just simply took the usual blunt instrument of the day and they incited a mob to violence, shouting, these men who've turned the world upside down have come here also. And I think that's a wonderful description, a wonderful description of those first disciples of our Lord Jesus. And in fact, many of the best descriptions of Christians over the years have come from those who abused them. They were terms of abuse. We think of the Puritans, the Puritans because of their way of life. The Methodists, the Methodists, the, the way in which they lived and behaved. Quakers, how can you quake in the, your worship of God? Even Protestants, of course, have that name. I'm not sure about Baptists. I don't, that's not quite a, 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 perhaps it was turning up of the nose of the established church towards those who were baptized by immersion. Terms of abuse, men who turned the world upside down. What a fabulous description of the early followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and what indeed is an accurate one. Now, obviously, one could explore many aspects of the Christian message which fitted that and which gave rise to the ac accusation. But this morning, I just want to look at two, just two aspects. You, you might, might think at first sight they're apparently contradictory themes. They're the topic of grace. 
the topic of grace and the topic of conduct. Because these were the two strands of Christianity which so appalled and so challenged the ancient world. They challenged them into opposition, to resistance, and eventually, in many cases, into submission. Grace. Grace, it is a charming sound, harmonious to the ear. Grace is God's free and unconditional offer of love, kindness, and forgiveness in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's an offer made to the poor and to the undeserving, an offer which is independent of sex, independent of age, independent of nationality, independent of education or social standing. And it's no wonder that the ancient world was so appalled by grace. Goodness me, particularly the re religious world, Jewish or pagan, because good heavens may attract Gentiles, it may attract slaves, it may attract sinners or even children, and God forbid, women. And that was the view of the ancient world. And grace covered all those in their needs. And Jesus' lovely, lovely messages all cover the needs of those who are undeserving and needy. Most of all, of course, it required an admission of helplessness and of need, and of guilt, and few in the ancient world were prepared to admit that. A friend of mine, many years ago, as a student, um, very bravely preached on the subject of sin in a very respectable Methodist church. At the end, he stood at the back, and a lady come up, came up to him afterwards and said, young man, if we really are as bad as that, may God help us. <laughs> and that's a wonderful summary of grace because we are as bad as that and God in Christ has helped us and all the world's religions then and now offer a way to God which depends depends on us depends upon our deeds depends upon our actions depend upon our background depends upon our goodness and Christianity alone extols that wonderful grace of God in Christ's free gift, independent of our merit. I put in the magazine some time ago a lovely account of C.S. Lewis at a conference. It was a British conference on comparative religion. And experts from around the world debated what, if any, Belief was unique to the Christian faith, and they discussed all the possibilities. Incarnation? Mm -hmm. Other religions sometimes had different versions of gods appearing in human form. Resurrection? Well, other religions had accounts of return from death. And the debate went on for some time until C.S. Lewis wandered into the room. What's the rumpus about? He asked and heard in reply that his colleagues were discussing Christianity's unique contribution among world religions. And Lewis responded, oh, that's easy. It's grace. It's grace. And after some discussion, they had to agree. The notion of God's love coming to us free of charge, no strings attached, seemed to go against every instinct of humanity. The Buddhist Eightfold Path, Hindu doctrine of karma, Jewish covenants, Muslim code of law, each of those offers a, a way to earn approval with God. Only Christianity dares to make God's love unconditional. A lovely, lovely statement. And of course, the story of the prodigal son in one of Jesus' parables in Luke chapter 15. This young lad who took everything from his father, went off, wasted it all in a foreign land, came back and his father greeted him and bestowed upon him riches and a wonderful, wonderful welcome. And the older brother said, it's not fair. It's not fair. And it isn't fair, said the ancient world. It's not fair. The Yancey in the same book mentions a preacher who turned that parable around 
where the father bestows all the riches and the honor and the accolades upon the older brother. And as he preached it, a woman at the back says, that's how it ought to have been. <laughs> but in Christianity, it isn't. It isn't. It's grace, God's kindness, God's mercy. It isn't fair. Thank God it isn't fair that he looks upon us in love, in mercy. If it were fair, we'd all be dead. Secondly, conduct. Conduct. Well, because true grace isn't a theory. It can never be used as an excuse to continually fail. True grace is life-saving, life-transforming force. And you only have to look at the language of salvation. It's a language of transformation, a language of change. We're saved, rescued, converted, redeemed, born again, washed, cleansed, raised, made alive, changed from darkness into light, old into new. We're not our own. We've been bought with a price. All these things speak of transformation through the grace of God in our Lord Jesus. Upside down. Well, yes, God first, others second, us last. Well, that seems a funny recipe for self-fulfillment, doesn't it? The complete opposite to how the world sees things. Poor lived. We live in an increasingly selfish society, a what's in it for me society. You've only got to look at some of the magazines or listen to the radio or the television. The blame of what goes wrong lies everywhere except with oneself. Some years ago, someone said that America was turning into a have you sued your neighbor today society. And that's not far off the truth, is it? It's be and we're becoming the same, and we've only got to read our newspapers, listen to the TV to see how this suddenly works out in so many high-profile cases. As I say in the army, no names, no pack drill. But we've had some very high-profile cases recently. And if you glance through the letters of the New Testament, those of Paul, those of Peter in particular, it's amazing how much emphasis is placed upon right relationships, holy living. Grace is to be passed on. We are to love one another. We are to be kind to one another. Tender heart is forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Paul's view on marriage are often criticized in the modern church, but far from being a woman hating ogre, Paul's view sent shockwaves through the ancient world. A husband is to love his wife. A husband is to care for her in the same way that Christ loves and cares for the church and gave himself for her. What more tender expression can you have than that? And what sort of message was that to the pagans who had treated their wives like cattle? Or to the average Jew who thanked God every day that he was not born a woman. Lovely, lovely words that Paul has that we are to love one another as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And I'm sure that Christian families were one of the biggest catalysts in the ancient world for the growth of the early church. And of course, they continue to be so in the pagan societies today. I think I mentioned some time back an account by a chap called Daniel Niles. He tells a story of some missionaries who labored long and hard among an African tribe. And they were pretty hard nosed, hard bitten folk. And eventually, just one family, just one family from that tribe became Christians. But shortly after, the eldest son fell seriously ill. And the parents and the missionaries prayed for the child's recovery and they longed desperately for a healing because if the child was healed, surely that would prove to the superstitious tribesmen that God was real. But in spite of their prayers and in spite of all the medicine they could find, the boy died. And surely they said, this really is the end of our work. They're never going to believe us now. 
But to their amazement, the chief of the tribe came to them and said, we want to become Christians too. And they were startled. Why? We want to have a God who can make us strong to face death, they said, the way in which you and that boy faced it. Not words, but deeds, one around that tribe. Lives lived in accordance with the gospel and with a sure and certain hope of the promises of God. And of course, the other aspect of our walking in love is that of love toward others, reflecting God's love for us. It's love for the poor, love for the underprivileged, love for the undeserving, love even for our enemies. And the early church, if we look at 2 Corinthians, some of the later chapters there, we find that they made provision for the poor, made contributions, distributions for widows, the poor. They took in refugees. And they made collections for family relief. What do you think is the most effective form of evangelism today? Bring back Billy Graham or a Billy Graham type crusade. Door to door visiting. Flood the area with tracks. Drag people into church. All these things have been suggested and I'm sure all these things have their place. And of course, it's very good to grasp opportunities when they arise to talk to folk, to witness to folk. But the problem is, of course, that very few of us have that spiritual gift of evangelism. And as far as we're concerned, I think the answer is at the same time both more simple and more difficult than that. It's for individual Christians, for you, for me, to do justice, to love kindness and to walk humbly before our God and to show by love, by our behavior, and by our example that God's way is best, that the gospel works, grace works, the Holy Spirit works in the lives of those who trust the Lord, and that the gospel is the only true good news, as vital, as applicable in the 21st century as in the first. And we are to show that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and then forever. And that the gospel has not lost its ancient power to forgive, to restore, to heal, to transform. But unless we are forgiven, restored, healed, transformed, unless we can recapture in our lives that wonder, the wonder of, of an amazing grace, how can we expect others to be attracted to our Saviour. I expect we've all heard in our lifetime someone say of someone else, if that's what being a Christian is, then I don't want to know. And it's a very sad thing. I think most of us must have heard something like that when outsiders have looked at a member of the church and said, if that's what being a Christian is, I don't want to know. And there's a story of a 19th century preacher, wonderful preacher, of whom people said, when he was in the pulpit, we'd wished he'd never get out. And they then said, but when he was out of the pulpit, we'd wished he'd never get back in again. <laughs> and that's sad, isn't it? That's sad. The ancient world looked at the first Christians and they declared, see how these Christians love one another. And these are the men and women who turn the world upside down. So may the gracious Holy Spirit work in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives throughout this coming year that we might grow in grace and that we might be the same. May he bless his word to us here this morning. Amen. Of course, the only hymn we can possibly end with is that of John Newton's Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound, amazing grace, how sweet the sound.